highest crowdfunding success, massive failures, and even some industry-leading principles. Space games, and more so Space Sims, is an interesting corner of a gaming that I oddly came to join by pure curiosity. And now, years later, I think it's time we take a brief look into the history of space simulators. And as always, if this sort of work interests you, well, of course, do toss me a potato on Patreon or become a YouTube member, it really does help out. So, let's go! The first video game Pong was made in 72, and despite the early age of personal computing, whatever our monkey brains could think of, we put on screen. The early beefs and boops helped to raise a new generation that would help to ruin the economy. I, I mean, housing inflation. I, I mean, war. I, I mean, TikTokers? Oh god, help us. Still, the games at this stage were very primitive, but even so, with the space race in final stages after the moon landing, it was through the games that many kids and adults got to recreate these otherworldly events. In this time also, the topic of wars was not uncommon. And that's not counting the defrosting dick measuring contest between the US and the USSR. So it was no wonder that early attempts at flight games, as you pilot a Messerschmitt or Spitfires, was a common game topic. So born were the flight games, and along with them some extraterrestrial reskins of space games soon followed. And honestly, it was kinda hard to determine which one came first, the spaceship games or the aeroplane games. However, they would soon both intermingle as well as separate to their own distinctive niches. Funny that in my top 10 video for Space Sims, somebody mentioned a game called Star Riders, which looked and played very much like one of the games that would follow five years later. But anyways, here in the end of 70s, you could see the basic action-based flight combat, sort of lift off, if you will. Principles of these games were just to aim at an opponent and click fire button, not much more than that. Still, with Star Riders, while it had some interesting deathful mechanics for the time, visually it was lacking heavily, like many of the games for the time. Still, already back then developers did try to provide more than just random missions of pew pews, like for example Star Map and a few little other things. Though it's kind of funny that Atari did try to remake this game around 2011 and uh, <laughs> oh boy, well, all you need to know is just uh, go watch the old Total Biscuit WTF is about this game to learn more. Every game they've remade in this manner has not held a candle to the original and often is completely different to the original. Yar's Revenge is a good example of that. I didn't do a WTF is of Yars Revenge because it was completely and totally broken on PC to the point where if you ever changed any of the settings including the resolution from its default 1024 x 768 the game would crash so it didn't seem like it was worthwhile. In this case you do actually have a functioning options menu which already puts it ahead of Yars Revenge unfortunately what I've played of the game thus far it does not seem to hold up any water as a reasonably entertaining title. In the early 80s, the first aeroplane and space flight simulators came out. Think of the very first and second flight simulators, then followed by the first Microsoft flight simulator. And of course, their spacecraft equivalents. At the same time, for our space games, some basic space combat games were floating around, and it was clear that the genre was forming. However, even despite the fact that during this time, Star Wars movies were dominating cinemas. Well, that space game there looks like a thrill a minute. Why not try a real blast? In less than a year, it went from a golden age. It's part of the American culture. I mean, video games are just part of the culture as apple pie and motherhood. Now you're talking. To its darkest hour. Let's put it this way. A lot of people didn't like E.T. E.T. became the icon of the crash. It was really the d demise of the business, and we unfortunately didn't see it coming. 
this game is awful and otherwise lacking any redeeming values. So a lot of really bad games got out there. And not to say the bad games don't get out there still, but some really bad games got out there in the early 80s. From 83 to 85, the great gaming crash happened, which nearly destroyed the whole industry due to ever more increasing amount of trash games. And recovery from it took nearly the whole decade, and yet, among all of that, a curious game released. In 84, Elite appeared, changing the genre of space games completely. It combines space combat with additional open world design and trading gameplay. While previously mentioned Star Riders looks very similar, it also lacked refinement, and it really was just a combat game. Even today, as much as I hate to admit it, Elite was so refined for its time on mechanics and gameplay that it overnight split the space game genre as a whole. Now you would have a rather notable and clear distinction between space combat and space sim games. However, it was only till later that you would start hearing people use the separation between the pure combat ones and the sim name. At this time, well, any game where you would pilot a spaceship would be referred to as space sims. Yet, thanks to Elite, from now on, it wouldn't really be enough to just make a game where you pilot a ship and shoot lasers to be a proper space sim. Now, you would have to include not only trading or open world, but more so multiple systems and underlying universe simulation. Also, in this time, hardcore simulators appeared, paving way for the genre of space flight simulators. Of course, as mentioned before, for the general public, it really was just an umbrella term of space games or space sims that most used. And yet, thanks to the crash of the industry, latter part of the decade was stagnant and really not much changed in terms of mechanics, principles or even new titles. <laughs> Funny that despite Star Wars being the biggest thing at the time in the 80s, very few games overall came out. Thanks, Atari! However, after finally recovering from the crash, it was time for the golden age of space and other games. While Elite was already five years old by now, it still hung out with the best of them, and the first to join the list of renowned sub genre games was Wing Commander. The one thing that Elite was missing was visual presentation, a somewhat remaining staple of space sim genre to date. But whatever. Wing Commander, despite being a pure space combat game, was counted as one of the space sims, since, well, the public didn't really care much about the minor differences. What this game ushered was the visual bombast and spectacle that made the whole combat action part of the game actually the least interesting of it, due to the high quality cinematics, colorful designs and somewhat engaging story. And all of which, compared to nearly monochrome Elite, well, kinda set it apart. In fact, you can almost accredit Wing Commander's approach to spectacle, shifting or at the very least signifying where the games would go that decade. Followed by countless Star Wars games including X-Wing and TIE Fighter, Independence War and Free Space series, a lot of great staples and even more garbage space games released in those short 10 years. Also, this is when the timeline of Yamix starts. Ultimately though, innovation-wise, there wasn't much change in this time for space combat, space sims or space flight simulators. The technology was still too weak for the flight simulators to be of any interest except for the biggest dorks. Space combat games got prettier, but ultimately, after Wing Commander's flamboyant presentation, most other space combat games just simply repeated it, and stagnation on mechanics was apparent. And those fair few space sims that came out in this time were burdened by overcomplicated menus and mechanics, a very, very common problem for these types of games. So just remember, complexity is not the same as complicate-ness. Uh, 
Though I did spot some weird yet really interesting Russian-made game called Parken. And even back then it combined quite well the FPS aspect with the space sim elements. How the fuck have I not heard of this one before? So yeah, there were some very interesting experiments among the trash as well. But anyways, this decade the space game, the space sim umbrella genre peaked. But mostly due to repeating what a fair few successful forerunners did and ultimately paid the price for stagnation going forward. After seeing the lack of marketability in all three types of space sims as well as ever more increasing growth in the golden rebirth of gaming in 2000s, the genre of space games was left to smaller indie developers. You see, space combat games were played out due to the sheer abundance of them and lackluster innovation. Space sims got more and more complicated and obtuse to ever be properly marketable, especially graphically being overshadowed by the new kids on the block that is the FPS games and open world MMO games. Well, space flight simulators, like most other simulators of the time, got dorkier and even less marketable. However, with the added horsepower, ever more complex mechanics could be included. During 2000s, German developer Egosoft releases its X-Series games, and I like to think that they carried the torch for this decade. Still, after scrolling through the list of games that came out this decade, Jesus, it's like rummaging through the landfill of medical and nuclear waste. 2000s was really bad for space games. I kinda like to think that the tech was, at the time, basically like uncanny valley for this side of gaming. No one really wanted to make a cartoony style game like in 90s, nor the tech was capable enough to make it realistic enough for the 2000s, especially with Half-Life 2 and Crisis dominating graphics completely. Also, it's disgusting how many space games came out at this time and how little fucks some of the developers actually gave to make a fucking good game, rather than opting to market them harder. From idiotic controls, broken visuals, broken mechanics, stupid mechanics, horrifying Excel looking UI. Oh, hello there, even line. I blame you most of all for this. The 2000s really was a shit show of shovelware. It did not help that in early 2000s so many great games came out. Counter-Strike, Half-Life 2, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, GTA fucking 3, many Need for Speed games, non-exploiting sports games, all of which were truly fun and interesting to play, now that the industry got some grasp on 3D graphics. Now looking back, fuck, my nostalgia is kicking in really hard and I want to go and replay them all. And you know, now that I look at it, uh, how many games were both innovative and more so refined and fun? It kind of makes the current landscape of 2020s look like a misery pile of rusted metal set ablaze by burning tires as kindling. What the fuck happened with good games? Anyways, it was extra hard to make and then sell any space sim at this point. The overcomplicated and frankly, quote unquote, dad game feeling space games just did not appeal to anyone anymore. When you had so many better and easier games to get into, this truly was a dark time for space sims. Yes, weirdly EVE Online released in 2003, a game with open world, combat, trading, exploration, well, kind of, and an MMO on top of it, and piloting your ship, kind of. It still wasn't enough, though, to call it a space sim. And reason for that, I think, is that while it tried to be more like World of Warcraft and MMO and more so, yes, you would control a ship, it was kind of detached from you in most of the time. And because of it, it didn't really fit in with the rest of the space sims. Still, one shining spot of the 2000s was that due to adversity and more so accessible development tools, everyone had a go at a quote-unquote space game. This also brought in many interesting mechanics and innovation. At this point, some games already played around with the idea of ship power distribution between three key aspects, engines, shields and weapons, or simply put, speed, defense and attack. Also, first interesting steps into ship customization were spotted in many of them. It was clear that 
the trend shifted and this very unappealing nature of these space sims in light of the greater examples like the shooters or driving games was going to stay. Regardless though, interest from small developers, kids who grew up playing these games in 80s and 90s caused many to finally to take up these proverbial arms and make their own space games. Yet weirdly, it would not be these small titles that would make the comeback for the genre. In GDC 2012, Star Citizen gets announced by Chris Roberts and promises you the world, super high fidelity and detail. Now that we got the technology, Jim, we can rebuild him. Alongside Star Citizen, Original Elite developer also announces a new Elite game. Though it had not much to show for itself, this was the time when weirdly the appeal for less dumbed down, less peasantry consolified and properly complex game was sorely needed. And here at first Star Citizen promises you same visual quality if not better than your typical Call of Duty or Battlefield, but with more spaceships and more so ability to press individual buttons, fidelity, mechanics and the whole galaxy sandbox. Elite Dangerous then follows up by providing actual playable and very immersive game. And around the corner lurked No Man's Sky, a more casual cutesy game that only cemented the decade of these niche games finally coming to the mainstream. But let's return to the start of the decade. Star Citizen and Elite Dangerous, both big names from way back when, with near simultaneous announcements for crowdfunding, managed to generate insane buzz around them and around space sims overall, though mostly it was the Star Citizen that buzzed the most, with its flashy videos and of course Roberts promising you the world. And while Star Citizen started this rebirth, it certainly was Elite Dangerous that proved how possible such a a vast and complex yet approachable game could be. Unlike Star Citizen, they did not promise you the world and had little to nothing to dazzle the audiences with. However, two years later after the initial announcement, the game released in full and while for the general public, as it always is with space sims, it was very complex and hard to get into. However, from fans of simulators to casual plebs like yours truly that wanted something a bit more crunchier to get into, this was perfect. No longer space sims would spell out this dad game vibe of excel sheets of the boring mountain. Yes, I'm looking at you, Eve, online! Though, yes, these Rebirth era space sims were still complex and still often lacked the more obvious basics of the industry. LET THE FUCKING TUTORIALS! Still, they were properly approachable by the general public. This is where my story began with this part of the gaming. Because it wasn't EVE Online. I was and still am a shooter fan, someone who likes uh, rather simpler games with underlying complexity. And Elite weirdly grabbed my attention. And even though there was a complexity and the menu after menu after menu after menu type of a deal, they also didn't quite look like those Excel sheets. The same goes with Star Citizen. Uh, well, eventually. At the end of 2015, Star Citizen releases a... Uh, some kind of public and what laughingly can be called playable open world alpha? It was literal slideshow of inconsistent and low frame rates. And weirdly, it's not much better today in 2022 either. But that's not the point. Still, the proof of concept captivated people just as much as the sleek videos did. Though it also rose critique for the development and the state of the project with every following year. Regardless, after Elite Dangerous, above average game, as well as the proof of concept that was Star Citizen, both appeared in mid 2010s, with No Man's Sky in tow, it was clear the time for space sims was here. The tech was ready for vast simulated worlds, galaxies even. And one could even say that Star Citizen proved how much money was there in this type of a game. To this day, it continues to grow as the ever largest crowd funded game, and by now surpasses even the biggest budget games of all times, you know, the Call of Duties and GTAs of the world. 
The mid-2010s was truly a great time for this niche. However, with the release of No Man's Sky, it signified a crumbling facade. Hello Games had lied to the public about the game and upon release, it was completely slammed by everyone. The backlash was massive, missing features, mechanics, everything imaginable. And with Star Citizen in tow with unannounced release date, many started comparing the hype and subsequent massive failure of No Man's Sky with this the biggest crowdfunded game in the history that Star Citizen was. But even today, six years later, we're kinda still waiting for the conclusion of it, which in of itself is not a great thing. Also in this time, Elite Dangerous didn't really accomplish much itself, and when all the three big names were basically either fucking up or doing nothing, another period of stagnation seemed to start. The interest waned, and though the titles like X4 from Egosoft released, well, it was an X-series game, really. Another dad game with horrible UI and questionable design, but with complex and interesting systems underneath. For better or worse, it seemed that Space Sims had bit off a bit more than they could chew, though in the case of Elite Dangerous, it's a bit different, and for the answer on that, you can take a look at my hypercritical series about the game. On the space flight simulator side, also this was interesting time. Finally, with enough processing power and fun design, Kerbal Space Program managed to set a new bar for these types of games. It managed to wonderfully bridge this overcomplicated and complex nature of literal rocket science with simple and easy to understand mechanics of a video game. While this though did not generate massive waves, unlike space sims for hard space flight simulators, Kerbals truly set a new bar. And for space combat games, well, they became even more disposable as a subgenre. While getting better at presenting and making a spectacle, these games always lacked a certain depth that the space sims would easily fill. However, it's not to say that there were no innovations. In late 2010s, Everspace wonderfully blended roguelike elements with space combat, while Rebel Galaxy and its successor Outlaw managed to nearly bridge the gap of space sims and the combat games, introducing actual trading, yet retaining its space combat action-based roots. And yet, not to be outdone by the sheer spectacle, by the end of 2010s, something unexpected happened. From the depths of the biggest outhouse in hell, No Man's Sky climbs out, keeps climbing until it surpasses its hardcore space sim peers and went from the most hated game in the whole industry to one of the most beloved. A recovery story that is hard to believe. These days, No Man's Sky serves as a wonderful first taste for space sims as games in general, and can be more than that too. How a game that is complete bullshit at start can, and with sheer will, determination, work, and good fucking effort, can come back and do so with gusto. And together with Elite Dangerous, these two games also established a very important keystone for space sim games. Exploration. Data collection or object scanning now is as synonymous as combat or trading among space sims. And here we are with the 2020s as it just started, and we already got our first big budget space combat games, which in my book are really just pretty looking and didn't really bring anything new. Star Wars Squadrons and Chorus. Competent games in of itself, but ultimately achieved nothing. Unlike Everspace 2, which has more depth and meaning. On Space Sim side, Elite Dangerous already managed to shit the bed so heavily it almost spells out the end of the game, and Star Citizen uh, still has not released and is becoming ever more larger joke of crowdfunding. A bad joke at that. While well, No Man's Sky being secretive but still releases really decent updates from time to time. And X4? Well, it's okay. The overall interest in space sim genre, even the umbrella version of this term, is low and coming decade, well, basically Star Citizen will set the tone for it. And yes, it could come out and be great, which is a possibility, but uh, I'm skeptical on that one. Instead, maybe release just two okay games at best and then the critics tear it apart like cyberpunk, or completely bomb and then it gets worse and worse, with this long-ass development and nearly half a billion dollars in budget. 
What happens will be interesting nonetheless. However, looking at the smaller developers, let's say like Rockfish with their rather entertaining Everspace 2 or Kerbal Space Program 2, or those super smaller developers fighting for the spot under the sun, maybe it could be something interesting indeed in the future. Maybe. For now though, that's about it on the abridged version of the history for space sims, or rather, space combat games, true space sims, and space flight simulators. Interesting how out of one of them we got three separate yet interlinked types of games which each has core principles and must have mechanics. Oh, and if you crave for a little bit more of the space sim stuff, well, I do recommend taking a look at the top 10 space sim video I did just recently. But that aside, as always, these videos I can make thanks to the great support over at the Patreon and YouTube members. So if you too want to pitch in even a buck or a potato for this Latvian so I can continue making videos like these, well, do check out the links down below. And of course, as always, I bet you will write down your favorite space sim. So go ahead. Let's see what you got.